All the machines are capable of 10 or 15 miles an hour faster in the first six, and the, most of them have done that speed in, in still air conditions. In this thing, it, it becomes so difficult just halfway along the 200 metres because there's a gust of wind comes in from behind the bushes. And once you've just, your concentration slipped for a minute from pedalling and you've thought about steering, you've then lost it all. The, more, the harder I try, the more it waves about. I can keep it in a straight line if I ease up a bit, but trying to get the most out of myself, I, I just let it go a bit. So uh, it's, uh, it's a compromise of going in a straight line and uh, getting full effort in. But the poppy flyer gets that compromise right, winning at 43 miles per hour. The strip today was pretty favourable to the poppy. The poppy's a very stable machine and these very windy conditions don't help the two-wheeler machines. And it was a short sprint run, which again is something very suitable for the poppy, I think. Absolutely. I, I think we were a bit surprised, though, because we've been running the same machine for four years now. And you would expect other people to become faster. As, as the sport progresses, you would expect mm. other machines to become faster than us, obviously. Um, but every year we seem to be surprised that there aren't any more advanced machines and, and, and we're, we're still fairly competitive and today proves it. Uh, but I think we're more competitive yeah. than, than we probably thought we were. Well, yeah, does it mean we've reached the ultimate in human power consumption? I don't know, we can't drink that much. <laughs> <laughs> this group have not just reached the frontier, they've crossed one to get here. Uh, we are from Holland. How did you get here? Uh, by cycle. By that cycle? Yes, sure. Why not? How long did it take? Uh, it was about nine or ten hours uh, riding a cycle. But it was... Uh, but uh, people uh, stopped, start talking, so we... It was one and a half day ride. I go to work, do shoppings, everything. Go to the, to the games. No, I don't have a car. <laughs> this is my car. <laughs> a human-powered car. Machines that take you to work are as much part of the festival as the more exotic sprint devices. How does this sort of obsession begin? We went to watch the very first uh, speed challenge in this country of Brighton. Uh, we were very impressed. Uh, I was a cyclist, friends were cyclists. I was also an engineer, so, so it was a natural appeal. So we thought, right, we, we can do better than that. <laughs> we went away and we didn't. <laughs> we enjoyed doing it. Uh, but then the events started changing in as much as they were no longer just a 200 meter sprint, road racing became an element. Uh, and being cyclists, we appreciated the value of training. Uh, so we wanted a machine that we could actually train in on the road, pack in the miles. And basically this sort of knockabout format machine evolved from that, originally just for training. Uh, and very quickly we discovered that they were a lot of fun to ride, whereas the previous ones had been nice for competition but it, in itself it wasn't you know just 200 meters is 200 meters and it's all over but something that hacks around corners very much like driving a car around but without the need for 150 horsepower and lots of petrol and everything not a drop of petrol in sight the culmination of a year's private effort in industry is now in public view this race is around the houses or more correctly around the office block in central milton Keynes. the course is only 820 meters but the competitors have to race for an hour over 25 miles. It's a test of reliability and stamina, both of riders and machines. dedication and fitness. And as the hour goes on, it's even more of a trial. At the checkered flag, 
Mike Burrows is a winner. My specific, the, the, the wind cheetah is designed primarily as a means of transport, as, as, as a fun means of transport, hopefully one which some people will find the most practical form of transport. A, a Dutchman living five miles from work should find this the best way of getting to work. If, if he's vaguely interested in keeping fit or getting out of some satisfaction out of life as opposed to being stuck in a traffic jam, um, then they wouldn't suit everybody, uh, even as they are. Eventually, you know, they're going to get better and better and then clearly suit a larger percentage of the population, but, but not everybody. People are inherently lazy and, and you know, I'm glad of it. I mean, I, you know, they're, they're all rabble and... <laughs> Cyclists are always better than anyone else anyway, so we, we don't want everyone on bikes. Peter Ross is another believer in the practicalities of these vehicles. The traffic around his home in Marlow holds no fears. He regularly commuted to Centre London in one of his machines. This is his latest design. Now, I think this is, this is a very interesting vehicle uh, because it carries more than one person. It's a, it's a forward for an adult and a child. It carries an appreciable amount of luggage. And it's got electric assistance, a little, a little electric motor here, and a, and a car battery, which allows it to, to accelerate rather faster and to assist on um, steep hills. In terms of its practicability as a commercial proposition, I personally wouldn't rate it terribly high. It is really quite large compared with an ordinary bicycle, even with a bicycle with a, with, a, with a child's seat. It needs a lot of parking. And I suspect there's a steady charging of a battery, for instance. I mean, I've got a good deal of experience of, of how well batteries are maintained it's going to be relatively expensive in terms of batteries. So I think it's an interesting and may well foretell the future. I'm not sure that if one actually put this on the market, it would enjoy any very great sale. Some other machines might be even more difficult to market. The pedal lever is almost inevitably Irish, and England also produces its own eccentrics. One whole day of the festival is given over to human-powered water vehicles. The technology is more primitive, but imagination has run riot. But for some, it is serious. Engineer David Owers is Britain's leading exponent of pedal power on water. I feel that the technology of both the canoes and the rowing boats is 100 years old. One feels that there must be a better way of doing it if they're 100 years old. Uh, also, taking the, the, the faster of those two, the more efficient of those two, the rowing shell, it has a very jerky motion when you watch the rowing shells, and uh, there is uh, a, a wake and uh, small whirlpools where the oars hit the water, which means there must be some drag there, um, some energy being lost, and possibly a propeller could be more efficient than rowing. Uh, well, pedal power gives you continuous power input as opposed to the inter intermittent jerky uh, motion of a rowing shell. And the hydrofoil supports are, are more efficient at higher speeds, speeds of about seven or eight knots, uh, the drag is actually less with a hydrofoil than with a, a wetted surface area, ordinary buoyant hull. Under perfect conditions, I can give them a good run for their money. Unfortunately today, as you see, it's very windy, very choppy out there, and uh, had a lot of problems with weed today. So it's not fully developed yet, I think is the uh, tactful way of putting it. This is a flying fish, another hydroplane, the brainchild of Alan Abbott from California. It's the fastest human-powered vehicle on water. The purpose of flying fish is merely to outrun, uh, outperform a road shell, which has traditionally, for the last hundred years, been the fastest human-powered boat. Uh, flying fish actually flies like an airplane with the wings in the water. Uh, the wings maintain a position roughly 8 to 12 inches below the surface of the water. And the most difficult matter was controlling the position of the 
craft so that the wing stayed in just the right position relative to that surface. Um, it balances like a bicycle and it uh, maintains its depth through a little elevator just like on the tail of an airplane and learning how to design and, and uh, operate a vehicle like that was something that no one else had done so we had to start from scratch and, and develop the control. Well, after a weekend spent with the exponents of human-powered vehicles, I cannot but be impressed by their motivation and creativity. And just as an aside, technological creativity has never been thought to equal artistic achievement, a distinction which I personally believe to be entirely without foundation. What these machines probably do not foretell is the future of human transportation. Not all do hot air balloons or hang gliders for that matter, but they are a tribute to the ingenuity of the human mind, and most of all, it's fun.